If you're feeling spicy about rebellious real-world metaphors and subversive myth-making, then here's everything you need to know about the ending of Dune Part 2. Dune Part 2 picks up right where the first film left off. Baron Vladimir Harkonnen and his army have wiped out most of the Atreides clan, while also taking over production of the precious substance known as Spice on the planet Arrakis. Meanwhile, Paul Atreides and his pregnant mother, Lady Jessica, meet the Fremen leader Stilgar, who takes them to a secret spot to remain safe. This is because Stilgar believes that Paul is the Lisan al Yi, the Fremen's long-prophesied messiah. Paul is uneasy about this, though, as he knows that the myth of the Lisan al Ghib was made up centuries earlier by the secretive Bene Gesserit organization. His mother is a Bene Gesserit member herself, and she stokes the myth to her benefit as she becomes a reverend mother to the Fremen. Paul then attempts to ingratiate himself with the Fremen, especially the skeptical Chani. He eventually earns his place in the tribe by destroying the Baron's spice mining operations and successfully riding a giant sandworm. At the end of Dune Part 2, Paul begins to abuse his messianic reputation to control the Fremen more thoroughly. After Baron Harkonnen's nephew Raban fails to contain the Fremen, the Baron employs Raban's even more ruthless brother Fade Rauta to quell the rebellion. Fade's ruthlessness eventually pushes Paul to accept his role as Lisan al Ghib in a bid to lead the Fremen against the Harkonnens. Paul also challenges Emperor Shaddam IV to show up on Arrakis as well, lest Paul expose his illegal collaboration with the Harkonnens to wipe out the Atreides. What then unfolds is an epic, explosive battle as Paul unleashes his Fremen followers against the visiting Emperor's army, eventually overwhelming his forces and killing off the remaining Harkonnens. However, Paul leaves Shaddam alive so that he can ascend the throne by marrying Shaddam's daughter, Princess Irulan, much to the chagrin of Chani. The rest of the Empire doesn't accept Paul's ascendancy, which leads him to order the Fremen to commandeer spaceships and begin the holy war that his visions warned of. It's been a while since you've had one of those nightmares. The ending of Dune Part 2 is partly a takedown of the white savior narrative. These types of stories have a reputation for justifying racism, classism, and colonialism. Science fiction is frequently guilty of this trope in which a white character comes to a supposedly savage place to save the natives from their backward ways. Dune tackles this uncomfortable trope head-on, both in Frank Herbert's novels and the films directed by Denis Villeneuve. By making Paul a megalomaniacal tyrant at the end, it warns audiences how this kind of thinking has led to countless genocides. In these types of narratives, cultures are othered in much the same way that the Fremen are mistreated on Arrakis. As Herbert himself explained during a talk at UCLA in 1985, I wrote the Dune series because I had this idea that charismatic leaders ought to come with a warning label on their forehead, maybe dangerous to your health. The Dune novels are clearly critical of religious institutions, which is made explicit on screen in Dune Part 2. In both the book and the film, the secretive Bene Gesserit plant fake prophecies and myths around the galaxy to exploit in the future. One of these false prophecies is that of the Lisan al Ghib on Arrakis, which is why part of the myth involves Paul's mother being a Bene Gesserit. Herbert spelled out the problem with religion by writing in the first Dune novel, much that was called religion has carried an unconscious attitude of hostility toward life. The teaching of religion by rules and rote is largely a hoax. Dune Part 2 does a great job of showcasing these themes. As the Reverend Mother, Lady Jessica utilizes the myth to incite and further radicalize the fundamentalist Fremen in the south of Arrakis against Paul's wishes. And then when he finally decides to use the Fremen to his own advantage and take revenge, it's clear just how effective and dangerous those myths are as a tool of colonial control. This prophecy is how they enslave us! Dune is the story of a rare resource that can only be mined in the harsh deserts, as various colonial powers fight over its control. Whereas the real world's precious resources are fossil fuels like oil, the commodity in Dune is melange, aka spice. Similar to how most of the world's oil is mined from the Middle East, spice only exists on Arrakis, and it's used for interstellar space travel. Unlike oil, though, spice isn't fuel, though it does give the ship's pilots the ability to navigate the cosmos at superhuman speeds. Frank Herbert makes these real-world connections unmistakably explicit. The whole plot of Dune is about fighting for control of the Spice, and that's the reason the Harkonnens massacre the Atreides in the first place. This leads Paul to seek revenge and eventually unleash the Fremen on an interstellar jihad that claims billions of lives. In essence, commerce and capitalistic greed are the root causes of all the tragedies in Dune. Dune Part 2 and the Dune series as a whole are also about the philosophical push and pull between fate and free will. Paul Atreides has the power of prescience, which is essentially the ability to see the future. However, he can't make it out clearly at first, as he's initially only able to perceive flashing fragments. That changes when he inhales the Water of Life, which opens up his abilities. Furthermore, Paul can witness the flow of time splintering into multiple possibilities all at once. This is comparable to a crashing ocean wave. You can swim in many directions at first, but a choice has to be made before the wave of time eventually crashes upon you. This begs the question, does Paul freely choose his role as the genocidal Muad'Dib, or is that always the course he was going to take? This is an interesting philosophical debate about the nature of free will and choice, which the story leaves purposely vague. 
However, it still brings up the question of what Paul's true nature is. If there really is only one path he sees in all the timelines where his revenge succeeds, is it worth galactic genocide? There is a narrow way through. The ending of Dune Part 2 leads straight into the story of the second book, Dune Messiah, which would serve as the basis of a third film in a proposed trilogy. Messiah is set 12 years after the first Dune, as Paul's fanatic Fremen army has laid waste to the universe in a genocidal war. Messiah presents Paul as both a leader and religious figure, with the legend of the Muad'Dib having spread throughout the universe as someone to be feared and worshipped. While the galaxy is being torn apart by the Fremen's merciless jihad, Paul resides comfortably as Emperor with Chani as his mate, even though he's betrothed to Princess Irulan. This leads to palace intrigue as Irulan conspires to have him assassinated. Meanwhile, Paul tries to manipulate his vision so that Chani and his future children can live despite the conspiracy. This is all set up in Dune Part 2 as Paul becomes more maniacal, and the romantic rivalry between Chani and Irulan comes into focus. One of the biggest changes that Dune Part 2 makes to the original book is the exclusion of Paul's younger sister, Alia. She does appear in the film as a fetus who talks to her pregnant mother, but in the book and all other filmed adaptations, there's a time jump of a few years that features Alia being born and walking around as a creepy little girl. Alia, now, come to me, Baron. In contrast, the only time that Alia appears in the flesh in Dune Part 2 is during a flash-forward vision in which Paul sees her as an adult played by Anya Taylor-Joy. This change was probably made to condense the story's timeline and lend it more urgency. However, this does bring up the question of whether or not there will be an even bigger time jump between the Dune and Dune Messiah films. Messiah is set 12 years after the first book, but with the multiple-year time jump in the first novel, it's closer to 15 years in total. Anya Taylor-Joy will turn 28 in April 2024, but she could still play a teenager, or perhaps a narrative will move ahead even further into the future to more closely match her age. Denis Villeneuve's two Dune films are very faithful to the books, but like any adaptation, some changes had to be made. And in the case of this adaptation, Chani is made more aware of the centuries-old plot to create myths that supposedly predict the coming of a messiah as a form of cultural control, thereby setting her up as a rebel. This is a major departure, as the book version of Chani is a devoted believer in Paul once they fall in love. In fact, after he takes Princess Irulan's hand in marriage due to crass political maneuvering, he makes it clear to Irulan that she won't bear any children and that Chani is his romantic partner. This plays out very differently on screen, as Dune Part 2 ends with a close-up of Chani's distraught face. It's unclear, though, how this will affect the Messiah film. That book's plot largely hinges on who will bear Paul's royal heir. Based on Part 2's ending, it seems very possible that Chani's role as a doting lover will be changed, and that she'll instead be a more antagonistic figure in the next sequel. Denis Villeneuve has talked in interviews about how Dune Part 2 closes on a cliffhanger. While the film's final sequence is similar to the novel's conclusion, there are some key differences. For instance, while Paul has nightmares about an upcoming holy war that'll happen once he becomes emperor, we don't watch it come to pass the way that it happens on screen. However, in Dune Part 2, after Paul receives word that the other major houses in the Imperium won't support his ascension to the throne, Stilgar leads the Fremen toward the ships to attack. Villeneuve explains his downbeat ending by noting to Vanity Fair, The Dune book ends with the beginning of something that is out of control, and I thought this was a very powerful ending. Villeneuve also explained about his desire to adapt Dune Messiah, which he described as the end of the arc of Paul Atreides. It would make absolute, absolute sense for me to make a final film and revisit Arrakis a very last time. It also seems likely that Villeneuve won't direct any more Dune sequels after Messiah. As he admitted to Entertainment Weekly, Herbert wrote six books, and the more he was writing, the more it was getting psychedelic, so I don't know how some of them could be adapted. Dune Part 2 clocks in at a running time of 2 hours and 48 minutes, but there were still some things left on the cutting room floor. This includes entire subplots and characters that were completely excised, including one played by Tim Blake Nelson. He was officially cast, but he doesn't show up at all in the finished cut. There have been persistent rumors that Nelson was set to portray Count Hasimir Fenrig, as he looks similar to how the character is described in the book. However, this speculation hasn't been officially confirmed. The Count is a deadly assassin and trusted friend of Emperor Shaddam IV. At the end of the book, he's ordered to kill Paul after Paul defeats Fade Rautha, though he refuses. The Count's supposedly deleted appearance is further evidenced by the fact that Leia Sadu plays his wife, Lady Margot Fenrig. In the film, she's the Bene Gesserit who watches Fade Rautha fight in the arena on the Harkonnen's home planet, and she later seduces him to control him for her order. Her inclusion may not outright confirm the existence of Count Fenrig within the film's continuity, but it does at least lend credence to a possible ending that Denis Villeneuve chose to discard. 